Uh, Timothy Ives is the lead archaeologist for the Rhode Island Historic Preservation and Heritage Commission. I think I got the title right. Of the commission. Uh, and is well known in the preservation and archaeological community statewide uh, and in the southern New England area. Uh, so Tim very graciously agreed to be our speaker today. Uh, and I'm aware that he is at a handicap competing with the gorgeous weather, the gorgeous view, uh, the general level of ambient light in the room, and the conviviality that I can hear, which is very gratifying. Uh, but Tim is hopefully equal to the task. I should have said hopefully. I know Tim is equal to the task. Uh, and so without further ado, Timothy Ives. Hello, folks. Uh, I'd like to thank the Barrington Preservation Society, and especially Nat, for giving me this opportunity to have an excellent meal with some excellent preservationists. A few notes before I start. I wish to clarify that while I work for the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission, I'm not here today in that work capacity. So understand that the following does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of that agency or the state of Rhode Island. I'll aim to speak for half an hour, otherwise I might put you to sleep. If you have any questions along the way, please hold them till the end. And uh, what you're about to hear is based on research it's currently under peer review for publication consideration, consideration in an obscure journal. <laughs> I only publish in obscure journals. All right. Um, all right. In recent years, the old stone heap sites commonly found in New England's forested hills have become politically controversial objects. Native American cultural authorities and antiquarians often identify groups of stone heaps as elements of ceremonial stone landscapes that past Native Americans constructed for any number of purposes, such as honoring the dead and tracking astronomical phenomena. Archaeologists have long interpreted local stone heaps as the signatures of used and abused hill farms that were abandoned only a few generations ago. I am in the latter camp, though it is not necessarily a fashionable camp to occupy in this political moment especially when the preservation of Stone Heap sites is being promoted as a Native American social justice cause and perhaps even an anti-racist mission. Politics aside, while I actively support the preservation of such sites, I remain convinced that the vast majority probably originated as agricultural relics rather than ceremonial complexes. I've researched this position from several angles and will share the latest with you today. Recently, I searched 19th century journals and newspapers to see if there are any accounts of farmers building stone heaps in their fields and pastures. I wanted to see if it was true that no such historical accounts exist, which has been a routine, cla routine claim among ceremonial stone landscape researchers. I found that such accounts do indeed exist, and if we consider them against the backdrop of the region's broader agricultural history, we may be rewarded with some modest insights into a modestly, uh, marginally documented, but geographically widespread rural practice that has been forgotten. <clears throat> a note on my terminology. Previously, I have termed individual stone heaps cairns, and groups of them cairn fields. But seeing that these British borrowings appear in none of the following accounts, I've decided to start using the more locally, historically germane term stone heap. And for the purposes of these discussions, New York State is an honorary part of New England, recognizing that the stone heaping phenomenon doesn't simply stop at the border. To understand when and why stone heaping appears to have been widely practiced in New England hills, a broad brush overview of their agricultural history is necessary. Colonists began establishing farmsteads in southern New England's interior hills in the late 17th century following King Philip's War. Endowed with considerable timber reserves for building construction, fencing, and fuel, colonial hill farms operated through much of the 18th century with little reason to consider sustainability. These farms usually encompassed under 100 acres, were economically self-sufficient, and produced few market products. However, a generation of young farmers brought up during the post-revolutionary war baby boom was determined to meet 
if not exceed their parents' success. In the opening years of the 19th century, they finished subdividing the interior into a rolling tapestry of farms. Small mills built along tributaries gave rise to villages and hamlets, which in turn opened new markets for local produce. Unlike previous generations, this one ran headlong into sustainability issues as wood, land, and fertile soil grew scarce. Farming the progressively deforested hills invited soil degradation, particularly from 1810 to 1840, when wool production became a principal venture. During this period, sheep flocks expanded, as did the number of small wool processing mills, contributing to a so-called sheep fever or wool craze. This trend was most pronounced during the 1830s, a decade dubbed the golden era of sheep raising. In 1853, a seasoned farmer recalled the economic rationale of those days, when one would profit better from converting, quote, his old fields into sheep pastures, unquote, than raising crops which had higher labor costs. But the environmental costs of wool's easy, short-term profits were undeniable. As ecologist Tom Wessels notes, a large percentage of the exposed bedrock in the region today owes its presence to passed over grazing by sheep. Uplands were left stonier every time their silty runoff choked streams and rivers. As another scholar put it, many of the region's farmers were skinning the land and they knew it. Yet even during this golden era, the decline of hill farm culture loomed on the horizon. <coughs> by the 1830s, westward migration had become a topic of widespread social concern as reflected in the advice of a Vermonter urging neighbors not to sell their land to your rich neighbors for sheep pastures. But soon enough, many of the region's progressively run-down hill farms would hardly be worth selling. After peaking in the early 1840s, the region's sheep population declined as many farmers turned to dairying to satisfy expanding urban markets. State census records in Rhode Island illustrate the gradual depopulation of interior hills and concurrent rapid increase of coastal populations. As the mid-century passed, ruralites continued pursuing opportunities in cities, manufacturing towns, and the West. Consequently, the long-established habits and traditions of the self-sufficient hill farm were quietly falling out of practice. The old pastors, criticized in the Connecticut Homestead Journal as painful evidences of the wretched system of public husbandry, that has prevailed among us for the last half century, um, littered the countryside by 1860. It is, surprisingly, it is surprising how quickly abandoned hill settlements became public objects of mystery and speculation. North Smithfield's Hanton City provides an excellent example, but I digress. Um, following the Civil War, state governments began grappling with a challenge that would carry on for generations, figuring out what to do with abandoned farmlands. During the 20th century, states and NGOs amassed such land. Meanwhile, their secondary forests became popularly reimagined as natural spaces. I'll note that, the Rhode, I that Rhode Island has done a wonderful job acquiring such properties for long-term conservation. If you want to see the ruins of abandoned 19th century farms locally, explore places like the Big River in Arcadia management areas, or surf through digitized landscape imagery on the Rhode Island Geographic Information System. On the left is an aerial photo of contemporary forest. On the right is the same area shown in bare earth laser imaging um, that shows 19th century stone wall networks, car paths, and cellar holes. Um, here's another example from Shemokinook Hill in Charlestown. You know, if you look for these areas where it's like you think there's nothing in there, you look at it and it's an old grid system. It's been subdivided and farmed already. I could look at these pictures all day. I find them intriguing. Upon, upon um, encountering old farmstead ruins in the wooded hills, remember that by far the greater part of the westward migrants in early to mid 19th century America were the sons and daughters of New England. The prairies and woodlands that they developed into farms along western frontiers were, of course, originally inhabited by any number of Native American tribal groups. But the Young Nation's Indian removal policies ensured the availability of fresh land for yeoman farmers. Accordingly, I think it would be short-sighted to categorically regard stone walls, cellar halls, and yes, perhaps even most stone use. 
as mere relics of New England's agricultural heyday. Perhaps they are silent testimonials to the mass displacement of Western Native Americans in the name of manifest destiny. That's my capsule historic context for why we have so much 19th century stonework in our contemporary forest. Now to the main topic. One of the earliest accounts of stone heaps sited on farmland was provided by Johnston Verplain, the New York City resident who journaled throughout his month-long tour of upstate New York in 1822, a journey he took to avoid the height of a yellow fever epidemic, maybe an example of early privilege of some sort. There's a fever going around, I'll go on tour. Um, <laughs> with satirical flair, Verplain composed entertaining descriptions of countryside settings. For instance, when near Milford, he drew a facetious cultural connection between ancient Egyptians and local farmers. People in this part of the country must be, of course, of Egyptian extraction, and by the way, stones are actually piled up in fields in a pyramidical manner, which either proves the hypothesis or clearly shows that the Egyptians took the hint in the construction of their pyramids from our ancestors. <laughs> he went on to marvel at the surplus stone in this queer country where, in many places, looks as if it rained stones instead of water. Apparently, encountering field stones within pyramids was one way local farmers managed their surplus. Perhaps the most detailed account of agricultural stone heaping appears in an 1895 issue of the Providence Journal in a report on rural curiosities in Connecticut's northeasternmost town of Thompson. And I'm going to read the whole thing because it's great. On the Josiah Dyke Place in this region are a number of curious heaps of stones piled up without mortar into pyramids so well and so solidly built that although built 60 years ago, they are still in as good condition as ever, except where mischievous boys have torn them down. They were placed there over half a century ago by an uncle of the owners of the property. He was demented and spent his whole time in the fields, which are full of stones of all sizes, picking up the stones and placing them with great care in heaps, which tapered slightly and reached a height of six feet or more. The work was so well done that it became a wonder of the countryside, and people came from far and near to look at the stone heaps. Now they remain in the fields, visible from the road, although their builder has long since passed away, and few of the, few of the farmers in the locality know their history. I point out that Thompson is one of those towns where it still has stone piles in the woods. It's one of the sort of hotbed areas. This passage is wonderfully informative. First, it dates the construction of these particular stone heaps to the 1830s at the height of the sheep craze. The heaps were assembled from stones of all sizes, suggesting that any field stone could have been suitable to include. Their maximum height generally corresponds to the practical limits of a typical adult's reach when standing. And having been built with great care and tapered forms, the stones they contained were clearly intended to stay in place. Perhaps the most interesting implications are social. First, the fact that their building, their builder is qualified as demented probably means that he suffered from progressive cognitive impairment, the price many pay for longevity. In regard to this account, Stonewall historian Robert Thorson from the University of Connecticut qualifies the stone heaps in this account as a testament to dementia, but claiming the therapeutic value of stonework in happily passing the time as a form of engagement with the world, even when one's mind is slipped sliding away. Thorson also notes that the microhistory of this demented builder faded away in only six decades. Interesting. Uh, this account leaves us wondering why certain farmers would take such care in constructing multiple stone heaps rather than simply dumping them in one large sprawling pile. There may be many uh, practical benefits, none of which conflict. Neatly piled stones uh, occupy less space, they reduce transportation costs because they're not moved far, they remove tripping hazards for livestock, like the horse in this painting, this is a historical painting, this one, someone put up, maybe this guy put those stones up out of this horse's way, and that's my little, my little joke I put that in there. Um, but uh, they, let's see, what else do they do? Uh, they protect farm equipment from damage, and they open up new land surfaces for plant growth. Um, I have one paper where I sort of laid out the case for why I think most of these agricultural stone piles are in pastures. Um, and I basically hypothesized they're simply getting stones out of the way for new plants to grow, consolidating them. It's, it's, it's a math game. 
essentially. Um, illustrating that point, I found an account from a Vermont <coughs> farmer in a newspaper stating that we all pile stones in the pasture, causing two spears of grass to grow where only one grew before. We found it very gratifying to find actually a farmer uh, confirming that basic piece of logic that I you know, had rattling around in my head. It should come as a little surprise that stone heaping was also often relegated to children. Such work would not demand much, if any, supervision, nor would it require draft animals or heavy equipment. For example, a Vermont account from 1820 mentions children who seven years ago, last spring, were at work together heaping stones in a field. Among them was a boy specified to be about 10 years old. Uh, and among the many hints to farmers published in an 1834 edition of the Genesee Farmer, um, was advice on how to keep children busy. It specified, let them pick up stones about your farm and pile them in heaps to make a wall, repair the roads, or at least be out of the way of your scythe, hoe, or plowshare. The expectation that children would perform such work may have been strongly reinforced in some families. An extreme example is described in an 1836 Vermont paper uh, in an article titled, Industry, an Address to the Young. Right? That's how you reach young people. You put an article in the paper that says, this is, this is how you're supposed to be. Um, okay, now I'm going to read this passage. A certain father who was deeply convinced of the importance of forming his sons to habits of industry used to set them to pulling down heaps of stone and then putting them back again. He, he has been known to employ the many-a-day alternate removing and replacing of stones. Whether these exercises instilled the, the desired habits of industry was not reported, though the author warned that they risked disgusting the young. Childhood memories of stone heaping are most colorfully related in an 1873 account from Vermont. How well I remember, writes an ex-farmer, those warm, relaxing spring days on the old farm, when I was just large enough to pick up stones. What tedious, dull, back-aching, hand-rasping, boy-disheartening days those were. But I do not remember what force it gave us boys when we were told in the morning, boys, pick up a dozen good, large heaps of stone, and then go a-fishing for the rest of the day. Throughout the 19th century, consolidation, mechanization, and specialization came to signify progress across all American industries, including agriculture. Accordingly, it should come as no surprise that the traditional labor practices of small family farms would become gradually stigmatized as inefficient, outmoded, and perhaps even shameful. As one historian observed, the ideal of the yeoman in the popular imagination gave way to the emerging image of the rube. Farmers who left stone heaps strewn about their fields in plain view triggered a number of progressive-minded critics. The editor of the Farmer's Monthly Visitor exhibited such a slant in 1839 when he insisted that not a solitary stone pile is found encumbering the fields of a certain praiseworthy farm in Canterbury, New Hampshire. In 1837, a commentator from Maine suggested that the appearance of stone heaps and mowing fields is a signature of farmers who disregard common maintenance. In an 1872 Vermont Farmer article titled Removing Stones from Tillage Land, bluntly insisted that progressive farmers do not leave small, hopes, small heaps of stone scattered over their fields. If stone heaping carried any practical value on working forms, which presumably it did, people were doing it, progressive critics appear to have filtered such information out of their public discourse. But I can't imagine what filtering public discourse looks like today with the internet <laughs> and all of that stuff. Right? Some critics simply argued that stone heaping was inefficient such as an 1855 Vermont commentator who insisted that stone picked from fields should be thrown directly into a cart because the labor of constructing stone heaps is labor thrown away. Farming advice from another Vermont source in 1874 <laughs> specifies that mowing around stone heaps that lay in the field year after year is poor economy. The main board of agricultural agriculture similarly commented in 1860 that it is surprising that some farmers will clear their fields of stone and put them into heaps or piles, which are constantly an interference in cultivation. Other critics attacked the personal character of farmers who generated stone heaps. So I, I'm recognizing a little bit of the culture wars in the 19th century. 
That's what's in right now. Um, for example, an 1843 commentary argues that any farmers who mean to act up to the intelligence of the age are obligated to remove all substructions from their field. A patronizing article titled, A Few Hints for the Farmer, featured in an 1849 Vermont paper, insists that stones should never be accumulated in heaps in the fields because it is a slovenly practice. This sentiment is echoed in, an 1864, in 1864 by a Vermonter who did not like to see the rocks picked up and left in heaps. He condemned such practice as a shiftless and thriftless way that spoils a good deal of good land and makes bad work in the mowing. By the close of the 19th century, hill farmers were often regarded as backward-facing reminders of an agricultural heyday that had clearly passed. This sentiment flavors a 1903 article published by a correspondent for the Boston Journal. Regarding the discovery of gold deposits in Bridgewater, Vermont, he wrote, some of the people in this section are going wild over the reported discovery of gold here. Farmers who have piled up stones for years and years from the potato fields are now standing over some of those same stone piles with clubs whenever anyone who appears who looks like a geologist. <laughs> I wonder if the kind of scene he describes looked anything like this circa 1870 image from Lincoln, Vermont. The image of club-wielding farmers defending their stone heaps from an invasion of gold prospectors is certainly amusing, but probably not realistic and certainly not flattering. From such an angle, stone heaps would seem to stand in passive defiance against some progressive gaze. However, by the late 19th century, the societal turbulence of the industrial age had also pressurized a certain nostalgic undercurrent through popular culture particularly among people of so-called Yankee stock. Under these circumstances, stone heaps presented material reminders of the good old days of subsistence farming. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, stone heaps were still familiar elements of New England scenery and still widely recognized as the handiwork of rural farmers, though often from prior generations. For instance, a New Hampshire property owner wrote that his estate includes a woodlot of about 100 acres with a well-built cellar hole, while around through the woods are the eternal little stone piles that meant hard work and clear mowing. He recognized these stone features collectively as the remains of an abandoned farmstead and valued them as objects for introspection. Claiming that no one around here knows how old it is, he reported, when I feel blue on a Sunday, I go up there and sit down and smoke my pipe and wonder if the 35 cent dollar drove them out. A Vermont property owner similarly reported owning a reserve of pine timber in what once constituted a, quote, old field. He noted the visibility of rock heaps among the pines in an old cellar hole over which a numerous family of boys and girls were born. In 1910, a Maine resident recalled heaping stones when he was a young farmer. In regard to the latest winter weather, he wrote, this to some extent duplicates the month of January 1876, when the snow went off and the writer picked up a field of stone heaps since turned into pasture, but the stones are there yet to remind us of the fact. Similar accounts exist from southern New England, such as that in a report published by a botanical club in an 1884 edition of the Providence Journal. Regarding the area of North Smithfield, Rhode Island, known as the Blunders, they wrote, an interesting thing about the pine woods is that a little more than 30 years ago, the ground was a level cultivated field, which is betrayed by occasional stone heaps as thrown together in days long gone by. If their context is accurate, the Blunders was open farmland during the mid 19th century. Today, the forest floor at the Blunders is still dotted with stone heaps perhaps the same as those noted in 1884. You can go there and, and find them there. In 1888, the same newspaper published a letter arguing that Rhode Island's extensive abandoned farmlands should be brought back into cultivation. He characterized much of these lands as covered with stone piles that stand moss-grown, covered with briars, among oak trees that have the growth of a lifetime where men on the verge of 80 years hold corn and potatoes in their boiler. If his context is accurate here, that 
That boyhood work took place during the second to third decades of the 1800s. For an idea of what stone heaps looked like without overgrowth, we might refer to this undated photograph of Woodvale Farm, which is now part of URI's Alton Jones campus in West Greenwich. The farmstead looks remarkably the same today, as does the field, except that the stone heaps have long since been removed. Stone heaps are evoked as nostalgic rural imagery in a short story published in 1891 in the New York Weekly, and again in Connecticut's Waterbury Evening Democrat, with the title, To the City and the Sad Homecoming of a Wayward Boy. It was a parable on the moral and spiritual decay of young adults who forsake the wholesome life of a hometown farmer to pursue greater fortunes in the city. It was a very common trope. Um, <clears throat> When the story's headstrong New England boy left, quote, his good home for the city, the narrator laments, farewell to the broad, rough uplands with familiar stone heaps dotted over. That's where my interest in the story ends. All right, the boy tragically returned the following year in a casket after, quote, the city ground him up and spit him out. See, that's how the stories end. Don't leave. No, don't, don't leave home. The city will still destroy you. Um, <clears throat> We may never know what percentage of the region, region's field stones were quite literally ground up and spit out for road building in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As reported by one upstate New Yorker, farmers were demanding pay for the stone heaps that dot their fields in response to the scarcity of freestone near where the crushed stone is being used. Another upstate New Yorker reported there are, in all directions in this town, piles of stones on various farms, which the owners at their own expense would gladly draw to the road, providing the stone, when crushed, was used on the roads in their vicinity. It is remarkable that the farmers do not move in this matter. One Vermonter even predicted, a generation hence there will doubtless be but comparatively few stone walls or piles of stones scattered about the fields to be seen. They will either be in drains or used for permanent road making. Fortunately, for those of us who admire stonework today, early road building projects did not provide landowners with enough incentive to categorically eliminate stone heap sites. Modern observers have reported them from every New England state and New York state. So if we agree that the accounts reviewed here help explain the relative abundance of stone heap sites in New England's forests today, what does that mean? At the very least, it means that we have identified a once ordinary strain of knowledge that appears to have dropped from collective memory. We have forgotten that stone heaps once embodied the pragmatism of hill farmers struggling to keep their degrading fields productive. We have forgotten that stone heaps were disdained by certain progressives who enjoyed arguing against a caricature of presumably backward hill farmers. And we have forgotten that stone heaps became objects of quiet reflection for certain industrial age folk. Of course, one cannot fault New Englanders for collectively forgetting ordinary information after that information has lost its social relevance. That's how collective memory works. Nor can one fault contemporary people for reinterpreting seemingly mysterious stone features according to the cultural logic of their day. That is part of how people make sense of their world and their place in it. In any case, I love thinking about history, landscapes, and contemporary culture and hope you do as well. If any of you are interested in some light reading, I brought free copies of a few, of a few articles that I previously published. Uh, I will close with a simple request, and I'll take questions after. Um, if any of you run across additional historical accounts of agricultural stone heaving, or find any old black and white photographs showing stone heaps in uh, agricultural fields, please don't hesitate to share with, with Timmy Ives. Um,